Welcome to a 20-minute presentation of everything that it means to be purpose-driven. This is a very succinct presentation that is boiled down from four hours of training that we do for all of our pastors around the world on what is it to be a purpose-driven church. So I welcome you here to this presentation on behalf of Pastor Rick Warren, our pastor here at Saddleback Church. My name is Dave Holden. I'm the Director of International Training here at Saddleback Church. What is Purpose Driven and why do we do Purpose Driven? It all starts with one thing. First off, God is a king. And this king must be obeyed. He's building a kingdom and he uses me and you to be a part of it. But this king also happens to be my father. And so if I obey him as the king and I obey him out of the loyalty or I obey him because he's my father and I obey him with a heart of love, it's all the same thing. The word of the king must be obeyed. Now where do we find that word? Where will we know and learn what it is that God expects of us? Well, we learn it from his word. The Bible is perfect. It's always true. It tells us exactly what we need to know, how to live, how to grow our churches, how to be better pastors, leaders, better people, how to be better husbands and wives, what it means to be a disciple. Now, there are two great passages that we will always be referring to today. It refers to the Great Command and the Great Commission. Now, immediately when I say those words, you know exactly what it is that I'm talking about. You may not know where to find them in the scripture, we'll handle that in just one moment, but you know exactly what I'm saying. The great commandment, love God, love your neighbor. The great commission, preach the gospel, make disciples, and bring people into the church of Jesus Christ in a loving way through baptism. These great commandments and the great commission, they are famous throughout all of Christian history. They have been given this special nickname by God's people. The great commandment is found in Matthew chapter 22. And the great commission is found in Matthew chapter 28. They are represent five great commandments of the Lord Jesus Christ. A young man was talking to Jesus one day and he said, Lord, can you tell me what's the bottom line? What is it that I need to know? What's the greatest of all the commands? Jesus says, that's easy. Love God. Love Him with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, and strength. Everything that you are, all the things that you think about, you must give God every bit of your love. He's first in your life. The young man turned to walk away, satisfied with his answer. But Jesus said, now wait a minute. There's a second command, and it is as great as the first you must love your neighbor in the same way that you love yourself. Now, I don't know about you, but I love myself a lot. If I'm hungry, I feed myself. If I'm tired, I go to bed. If I need to put, get new clothes, I go out and get new clothes. I must love my neighbor in the same way that I love myself. Well, who is that neighbor? The neighbor isn't necessarily the people in your family. Your family's easy to love. The neighbor may not be your friends. Your friends are easy to love. The neighbor might be someone who's absolutely difficult to love, who's distant from you, culturally distant, religiously different, and they think different things than you. In fact, the neighbor might be someone that you would think that you would never have a relationship with. The neighbor are all those people in the world around me, and God says, love your neighbor in the same way that you love yourself. Jesus goes on in the Great Commission, and he says, preach the gospel. Everyone needs to hear about the love of God. And then he says, make these believers into disciples. They said, well, how, Lord? How do we make disciples? And Jesus said, a disciple is made by teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. So the mark of a disciple is this. A disciple obeys the commandments of Jesus Christ. Now, this disciple is brought into the church in a special way. If you remember what Jesus says next, he says, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is a symbol of our unity, our harmony, 
our fellowship. It's a mark of what it means to be a part of the family of God. When I am immersed in the waters of baptism, I come out of those waters a member of God's family forever. That's why in the church of Jesus Christ, we call one another brother and sister because we will be brother and sister. We will be a family forever. Now, these commandments, we boil them down into five words. Now, think about this with me. Love God. We call that worship. Serve your neighbor. We call that ministry. Preach the gospel. This is evangelism. Make disciples. That's easy. Discipleship. And bring people into the church in a loving way. Baptism is a symbol of our fellowship together. Listen again. Worship, ministry, evangelism, discipleship, fellowship. Now, these key commandments of Jesus Christ must be obeyed at all times. Now, here's the problem. Every year, I get to see thousands of pastors in, in literally hundreds and hundreds of churches. And I have found that generally, a pastor will build a church based on his own likes or dislikes. Here's an example. What about worship? Well, if the pastor loves to sing, it becomes a worshiping church. Everybody sings songs. The song service is long. We stand up. We lift our hands. It's encouraged by the pastor because it is a worshiping church. There's another kind of church. How about the kind of church that gets outside of the walls of the church and they serve their fellow man? This is called a ministry church. They might feed the poor and the hungry. There's another kind of a church. Some churches are heavy on evangelism, testimonies, public baptisms. These are all fantastic things to do because they reflect the heart of an evangelistic pastor. But there's a fourth kind of pastor. He was the top student in seminary. So he says, when you come to our church, I want you to carry your Bible. I want you to mark everything down in yellow, pink, and blue markers. I want you to take lots of notes in the side of your Bible because we are a Bible teaching church. He says, we are making disciples in this way by teaching the Word of God. There's a fifth pastor. This fifth pastor is kind of like me. He just likes to eat a lot of food. And so he says, come together. We're going to be a, a church that's built on fellowship. So whenever there's a baptism, we'll have a party. If there's a wedding, everybody's going to come. If there's a baby dedication, come on, everybody kiss the baby because we're all part of the same family. Worship, ministry, evangelism, fellowship, discipleship, all part of the church. Now, which one of those pastors do you really think is right? Well, they are all right, but just a little bit. Because I'll tell you why. God has given us five commandments. All five commandments must be obeyed all of the time. I don't get to pick and choose what I'm going to do. If the king, my father, speaks to me from the word of God and it's been recognized by the Christian church for the last 2,000 years, who am I to really choose what it is that I'm going to do in the church? I can't make that decision. I must bring balance to all five purposes in my church at all times. Now, how do I know when I've accomplished this? Well, in the book of Proverbs, we read that you will always know a tree by its fruit. If it's a good tree, you'll have good fruit. A good church produces a certain kind of good fruit. What is it? Well, a church that is healthy and makes disciples like this creates healthy people. These healthy people we are going to call disciples. A disciple says, Jesus Christ is the Lord over everything in my life, and I will write His commandments in my heart so that I will not sin against Him. I will balance these commands in my life, and I will live for His glory. I will worship Him. I will serve my fellow man. I will tell others about God's love. I will learn my Bible, study it, teach it to others, and I will welcome others into the church through baptism in the example set to me by my Lord Jesus Christ. Now the disciple becomes a very powerful tool in the hand of God. In fact, if you remember in the book of Acts, 
Peter and Paul were often teaching and preaching. Great crowds of people would come into the streets and they would look and see, what are these people doing? What are they saying? And what would happen is that the, the leaders would come out and they would say, hey, who are these disciples? What is this message? What are they doing? They are turning the world upside down. This is the function of a disciple. We are world changers, and this is the fruit of a healthy church. See, a disciple in the time of Jesus Christ would say, I want to become more and more like my master. So listen, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, into the world so that the world might be saved and changed forever. And now God sends us into the world just like his son so that the world can be changed. We do this with a significant ministry that we call the peace plan. The peace plan simply stated is planting churches that preach the gospel and promote reconciliation between God and their fellow man. The letter E in peace stands for equipping godly leaders, not self-centered, but leaders who will sacrifice for others. The letter A says we will learn to assist the poor. God loves the poor. The poor are among us always for one reason. It brings out the very best in us. In fact, God says whenever you help the poor and you give to them, you're making a loan to God, and He will repay you. He looks on this with great favor. The letter C says we will care for the sick. A part of Jesus' ministry while he was here with us on planet Earth was that he performed many miracles to heal the sick. And finally, you remember that Jesus Christ loved the little children. Our last and final E in the word peace means we are going to educate the next generation for the glory of God. These are giant problems that can only be solved by people who are dedicated to their cause the cause of Jesus Christ. We must become like Him and enter into the world stage just as Jesus did. Our hearts must be filled with the purposes of God. Disciples are made in Bible teaching churches that are making disciples in a healthy, purpose-driven way. Worship, ministry, evangelism, fellowship, discipleship, and everything held in balance. The Great Command, the Great Commission, the Word of God, the will of the king. Why would I do these things? For one reason. It's for the glory of God himself. Everything begins and ends with God's kingdom and his glory forever. This is just simply an echo of what Jesus Christ taught us to pray. God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth in exactly the same way that it's done in heaven. This is the role of a disciple. This is the purpose-driven journey. This is what it means to be a man or woman of God that is following hard after these key teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, how do we do this? We have learned to see the world in a new way. In the purpose-driven church, there are some people that are far from God and people that are very near to the heart of God. We have learned to identify these people and it's our task to move them closer and closer to Jesus Christ. These circles represent a group of people called the community. People in the community simply need Jesus Christ. The crowd are all of those people that come into your church and they visit each and every week. There's no other definition but you come to church. The next circle is highly significant because although I might visit the church, that really doesn't make me a Christian. I could join the Lions Club, I don't become a lion. I could sit in a chicken house, I don't become a chicken. I could go to church every day for a year and I don't become a Christian until I pass through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and I join that congregation of believers. This becomes my spiritual family that will last forever. Now, on, out, on the outside of this line, I can have lots of friends. On the inside of this line is my family, and it's my family forever. But once I get saved, it doesn't end there. 
I now take a new step. The next circle is the circle that we call the committed. And these are those persons who commit themselves to learning the Word of God. Next, there's a next step that I make, and it's a step into the core. The core represents all of the ministers and the servants. There are people that study the Bible, but they'd never have a ministry in your church. How do we motivate those people to serve in the church of God? Finally, the smallest circle is a circle that we call the commission. And those are the people that talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, where do we get the idea for these circles? They all go back to the commandments of Jesus. In our community, we learn to do evangelism. In the crowd, we experience worship together. And the believers become a great example to non-believers of what it means to worship. The congregation is where true fellowship begins. In the committed, this is the first step of discipleship, is to get into the Word of God. The core is where your ministries and your ministers are developed. And finally, in the commissioned, once again, this mission to tell others about Jesus Christ is our evangelistic message, and people are encouraged to bring others into the church. It, it's very simple, actually. We bring people in, we build them up, train them for ministry, send them out. Bring them in, build them up, train them for ministry, and we send them out again. And this is really all that we do. How do we do this? How do you move people who are far from God into the middle of God's will? We do it in a very simple way through a series of four classes. These classes, class one, a membership class, teaches people what it means to belong to the family of God. Class two is a class that we call maturity class. In the maturity class, you learn what it is to have a time with God in His Word every day, memorize Scripture, and accomplish those skills necessary to become a disciple. Class number three is our ministry class. In ministry class, we learn what it means to really serve God and how do I discover the right ministry for me. I discover it through my spiritual gifts, my passions for ministry, all of my natural abilities. God uses my personality and all of my life experience to serve Him. And then class number four. Class number four is called the uh, mission class. And this is where I learn to share my testimony and answer questions about Jesus Christ to my friends and neighbors all around me in the world. Now think about this for just one minute. We have the membership class. We have a maturity class. Our ministry class. And we have a mission class. Let's take it one step deeper. The membership class teaches me what it means to be in fellowship. The maturity class teaches me the meaning of discipleship. The ministry class makes me a Christ-like servant. And the mission class makes me an evangelist and teaches me evangelism. Well, there's five purposes. Fellowship, discipleship, servanthood, ministry, and evangelism. What is it that's missing? The fifth purpose is actually the most important. It's worship. Worship must be at the center of everything that I do. We must not put it into a special category of itself, but worship becomes the mark of surrender and the heart of the disciple. When I love you because you're a member of my family, I'm at worship. When I'm studying the Word of God, I'm at worship. When I'm serving in the church, I'm worshiping. When I'm talking about Jesus, I'm at worship. You see, it's a mistake to say on a Sunday morning, okay, now it's time to worship. It's like nothing else mattered. But the disciple is on the clock 24 hours a day, seven days a week, a heart of worship and surrender to God. There's one last element that I want you to see. 
These classes all begin with the church of Jesus Christ. So this would be my congregation, the committed, the core, and the commissioned. When I take class one, I'm brought into the congregation of believers. And it's here that I find my life in Christ. This is my fellowship. Class two, this is where I start learning the Bible and I become a serious student of Scripture. I move into the committed. Class three moves me into the core of the church where I become a servant. Class four moves me into the commission circle and it's here that I begin to talk about Jesus Christ. Class one, two, three, class four. It moves us deeper and deeper into the heart of God, deeper and deeper into the heart of obedience. Many people make a mistake when they think of a purpose-driven church, and they think of a, a great pastor who has a tremendous skill for communicating. He hands out notes every week, and he might have gone through a phase of wearing Hawaiian shirts. The music's loud. People might look at the externals, but what is a purpose-driven church? We have one dream. We are organized and designed to accomplish one thing. We want to become like Jesus Christ. The purpose-driven ministry is a disciple-making ministry. And why would we do everything built on these five commands? Because these are the words of Jesus. This is how I become like my master. He sends me into the world so the world will be changed. My heart is filled with His teaching, and I take actions to become more and more like Him. I'm made in a healthy church, balancing five principles, two key commandments found in the Word of God, all for the glory of the King. <sighs> I think that's about the shortest presentation that I can possibly do. This has been just a snapshot of a four-hour presentation. I hope that it has whetted your appetite to go on further. May God bless you and keep you, and thank you for watching this program today.